Welcome to the Economic Rockstar Podcast with your host, Frank Conway. Connecting brilliant minds in economics and finance. Hello and welcome back to another episode of the Economic Rockstar Podcast. And this is episode 149 with Sumeya Keynes. Sumeya is the economics and trade correspondent at The Economist magazine and writes for the print edition and the free exchange blog there. And before joining The Economist, Sumeya did research on the public finances and pensions at the Institute for Fiscal Studies, an economic research institute. And before that, Sumeya worked in the banking and credit team at Her Majesty's Treasury in London. She has an MPhil and a BA in economics from Trinity College, Cambridge. And she currently co-hosts the weekly podcast on trade economics called Trade Talks. So if you really enjoy this episode and trade is something that you are very much interested in, I would highly recommend you check out Trade Talks wherever you get your podcasts from. And you can find out more about Sumeya over at her own website, sumeyakeynes.com. That's S-O-U-M-A-Y-A-K-E-Y-N-E-S. And yes, that's Keynes because John Maynard Keynes is the great, great uncle of Sumeya. And as you may or may not know, Charles Darwin is also part of the bloodline. So in this week's episode, what we talk about, as you might have guessed, is all about trade. We discuss what's going on currently and regarding the situation between a lot of the countries now regarding the tariffs and restrictions that are being put on trade, the types of protectionism that's involved, whether it's coming from the United States or the EU, whether we should be suspicious about EU claims that they will not import meat products from the US because of the high presence of hormones, and whether this is backed by scientific evidence. We discussed the World Trade Organization and their brief history, as well as the general agreement on tariffs and trade, Trans-Pacific Partnership, NATO and NAFTA. Other topics of interest is the current situation regarding Brexit and if it's any way possible for Ireland and the UK to have a special relationship regarding trade once the UK leaves the EU. And Sumeya also gives us some recommended books and some great writing tips which should be invaluable given her role as an economics journalist with The Economist magazine. I'd like to mention the two books actually now. One is called Evicted, Poverty and Profit in the American City by Matthew Desmond, which is the winner of the 2017 Pulitzer Prize for General Nonfiction. And the second one is Janesville by Amy Goldstein, and they're both economic themed. And these books, which I have only first come across during the conversation, appear really interesting and is definitely on my wish list. So if you want to check out all the links, books and resources mentioned in this episode with Sumeya Keynes, please check out economicrockstar.com forward slash Sumeya Keynes. That's S-O-U-M-A-Y-A-K-E-Y-N-E-S. Or go to economicrockstar.com forward slash podcasts and you can find episode 149. If this is an episode that really interests you, I'd like to recommend two other episodes that have featured already in this podcast. One is episode 40 with Rebecca Harding on trade finance and how Delta Economics can help identify growth opportunities worldwide. And episode 144 with Donald Boudreaux on international trade, tariffs and protectionism. And just another word of thanks for all those who continue to listen to the podcast and download it and share it and if you haven't done so already please subscribe to the podcast on your chosen podcast platform and if it's possible leave a positive rating and review and if you can support the podcast in any way please share the podcast with a colleague or friend if you think they'd like this type of topic and if you'd like to support the podcast financially for as little as one dollar a month check out patreon.com forward slash economic rockstar to find out more and thanks again for listening i really appreciate it and really hope you enjoy this episode with Sumeya keynes trade was boring trade was really boring no one cared about trade for a really long time essentially apart from you know there were big protests with ttip but trade as its own thing couldn't really have sustained a large amount of interest from a general audience but now well, first of all, that's not the case. But I think the, you know, the, the purpose of trade talks is to to tell people that not only do these trade conflicts that we're seeing now, they have history, there are amazing stories behind them. 
Uh, I'd like to welcome you onto the podcast, Samaya. I, I have to do this, given your surname, if it's okay, Samaya Keynes. And is this something that people ask you about, given that you're an economist? Uh, you are not the first person to have brought up my surname. Um, so he's my great, great uncle. He died in 1946. So, uh, and he had no children. So, so you know, our our link isn't the strongest. Obviously, as he he died a, a while before I was born. But normally, what I say is that if you try to compare the two of us, then I'll I'll come across very badly. So mm -hmm. so maybe it's best not to. <laughs> oh yeah, it was just I. I didn't realize until I did a, a search and I saw the family tree and I realized then he was your great, great grand uncle or great grand uncle, great, great uncle. Uh, two greats. Yeah. Two greats. And yeah. And it's interesting. Obviously he's come up a few times in the podcast and someone recently had recommended an essay that he wrote called the economic possibilities for grandchildren. I guess I'm the closest there is to that. So, yes, that's it. Yeah. <laughs> so this is going to be an episode about you, Samaya. And I'm very much interested in, firstly, how you got into economics and then transitioning from research into journalism. Okay. Well, uh, I guess at school I was interested in economics. I did maths and bad maths and economics and physics. So I was very, very mathematically inclined and economics just seemed like this amazing practical subject with kind of lots of public policy questions that I found really interesting. So then I went to do it at university and really loved it. Uh, and I think there was probably a bit of a difference between me and many of my other, you know, my fellow students in that a lot of them wanted to go into banking or finance. Um, and I was never particularly interested in, in that uh, element to it. And I, I, I think I've always been a bit frustrated that a lot of people assume that economics is all about money. And I have to convince them that, no, I know nothing about your personal finances. <laughs> um, but from that, I decided I really wanted to go into uh, research. And so, well, so I, I joined the, the Treasury. So I was a, a government policy advisor working in the Treasury for a bit. Uh, and then I went to the Institute for Fiscal Studies, where I was essentially doing academic research on the state pension system in the UK, but also the interrelationship between health and socioeconomic status. So... You know, are you poor because you're sick or are you sick because you're poor? Mm. Um, that, that kind of into, you know, into place. So uh, that was amazing. Um, you know, thinking about, you know, using data to think about really big questions, um, you know, going right into the nitty gritty of, you know, how you design a state pension system and then zooming right back out again and thinking about, you know, how does redistribution across society work? Mm. So that was amazing. And then <laughs> um, essentially I got an email from the economics editor of The Economist uh, informing me that there was a job opening and asking if I would consider applying. And I was lured to The Economist <laughs> by the prospect of uh, my favorite bit of The Economist was something called the free exchange column, which is a weekly column uh, where at the time it was essentially a, you know, a review of, you know, academic eco economic papers on a particular topic. You know, it was an amazing uh, outlet to, you know, really think about, you know, cutting edge research, think about what the best minds in economics were doing and obviously written very well. So so I was lured to The Economist by the prospect of writing that kind of thing. Um, so, you know, not losing any of the intellectual rigor that I'd, you know, come to accept at the Institute for Fiscal Studies. Uh, but obviously, you know, in the world of journalism, it's a bit more fast paced. You get to cover a slightly broader selection of stuff. Um, and so, yeah, so I joined as the economics correspondent. And then a while into my job, my bosses said, hey, Samaya, why don't you take on the trade beat? Don't worry, nothing ever happens. It'll be very boring. <laughs> I don't think so. Um, and here I am. Trade is is quite busy, quite busy as a beat. 
Um, and actually, I'm in the I'm in the process of of moving to the US, where I'm going to be taking over as the US economics editor for the Economist. So, oh, wow. congratulations! Uh, I'll be covering the Fed and labor markets and all sorts of other very fun things. And where will you be based? Will it be Washington or New York mm -hmm. or Washington? Washington, yeah. The hotbed of policy, I suppose, where it's all happening. Indeed, yeah. So, um, yeah, like, I'd like to know how it feels regarding having worked with the Institute for, Fis for Fiscal Studies doing your research at a very much an academic level. I, I don't want to uh, pitch it in that way compared to The Economist, but I say with The Economist, it's a lot more fast-paced, whereas the IFS would have been doing piece of research, which might be ongoing and collecting data and so on. And whereas would the pressure be higher working with The Economist to get articles out reflecting on research that's been done out there well yeah i mean so so you know by definition the ifs is a research institute with you know it's an academic research institute uh, the economist is a magazine that is weekly so you know the the tempo of my life was slightly different you know clearly there are different kinds of pressures the pressure of a long-term deadline where you know that you have to you know you you have to deliver a larger body of work at the IFS compared to, you know, I have to deliver what a thousand words um, by this deadline, you know, that, that that's just, you know, by definition, a very, very different kind of thing. Um, you know, I'd, obviously there are very, there are some shared elements, you know, clearly at the IFS, I had to think very carefully about stuff in a way that I also do at The Economist. So, you know, there are, you know, I guess there are more similarities than that, but, um, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't the it wasn't a, as big a jump, say, had I gone from, you know, working at the IFS to, you know, had I been had I gone from that to covering kind of breaking news at Bloomberg. Right. It, you know, The Economist is a weekly. I have time to analyze and think. So so they're not they're not as dissimilar as it might sound, although, yes, clearly they are very different. And I can I assume I don't know whether I'm assuming correctly or not that you're being reposted to Washington because the World Trade Organization and the World Bank are located there too, and that way you can maybe maybe does, you don't need to be able uh, to be near those places, but to be able to access and figure out or find out what's going on regarding trade and tariffs and the discussions that are happening over there. So the, the World Trade Organization is actually based in Geneva, so I'm moving away from the World Trade Organization uh, and. You know, the World Bank, and the IMF, they're obviously oh, both based in, in D.C. Yeah. Um, I think, I mean, fundamentally, the, you know, the, the tenor of my job is changing. Um, you know, so I need to if I'm covering the U.S. economy, then I need to be in D.C. So that that's really why I'm moving. How long ago was it that you were asked to cover trade and tariffs with The Economist? Oh, uh, it was when Donald Trump's election victory was you know, a glimmer in Stephen Bannon's eye. Uh, so a little, a little while ago. Um, so there was a sense that something was going to stir then in that particular area that they positioned you to look at trade and tariffs? No, so I it wasn't in anticipation of Trump becoming president. I think it was probably slightly more boring internal reasons that, you know, I was the economics correspondent. It would have been an opportunity for me to specialize a little bit uh, I don't think anyone anticipated that trade would become the hot topic that it has become today. And regarding trade, what do you find at the moment to be very startling in terms of what's going on between countries based on the policies that Trump is trying to establish? So I think uh, there's maybe a divergence between what I find startling and what other people find startling. I think for people who've just woken up to all of this, this just seems completely insane. Um, and I think there's some elements of the Trump administration's trade policy that it's, I guess it's very difficult to find a logical rationale for them. Or, you know, I feel confident that if you explained in a room to someone very reasonable, you could persuade them that actually there are reasons why this is a silly thing to do. So, you know, for example, lots of people are very 
confused as to why the Trump administration is busy alienating allies like Canada and European Union when actually it has bigger objectives in that it wants to constrain China's trade policy. Um, and so so a lot of people are very confused, very concerned. They're, you know, um, very surprised that an American, uh, that the Trump administration is being so unstrategic about that. And they're also kind of, I think, surprised that the Trump administration seems so willing to blow up the whole system. And, you know, and then you see that in the fact that, you know, the president has justified tariffs on, uh, you know, the Canadians, the Europeans, on everyone based on this idea that imports are a threat to America's national security. Um, you know, you, you, you have at the moment you, this, the World Trade Organization, which represents the global trading system, is based on this idea that countries make tariff commitments and then they stick to those commitments because if they didn't stick to those commitments, then everyone else could hit them with tariffs. And the costs to doing that are so great that you just, you know, it's, it's worth your while to be in the system. The system is supposed to be self-reinforcing. Mm. Clearly, the Trump administration uh, or Donald Trump himself does not recognize the normal costs and benefits. Uh, you know, so I think it was Peter Navarro at one point, his his economic advisor, who who said, oh, they won't retaliate. Right. So that there's this kind of um, idea that America is really strong and no one would dare to hit back. And so, you know, that that's going on. And I think that's very surprising and upsetting to a lot of people who are used to the Americans being this very solid, these very solid leaders of the global system. Um, and so when I look at it, I, I, yeah, I see what Donald Trump is, is saying and, and doing. And a lot of it is, you know, you can find parallels that go way back to the, you know, the 1800s or even earlier when you have this idea of economic nationalism, you know, the idea that, uh, that tariffs will make America strong, uh, the idea that you, you need to, you know, protect American industry and that will make it grow. And that, you know, foreign competition is somehow weakening, um, America's economic interests. So, so he's not, so Donald Trump isn't the first person ever to have come up with his, his ideas. Mm. But there are essentially, you know, that, that there's a, there's a gap between some of the ideas that he's, that he's putting forward that are just a bit more outlandish. And some of the other actually much less surprising ways in which the the Trump administration is is attacking the system. So I've, I've just described this kind of way that Donald Trump is saying that, you know, rules don't matter. We can break the rules. But you have these two other strands of the Trump administration's policy where essentially rather than saying we hate all the rules, they're actually saying we don't think the rules are working for us. Right. So so you've got Robert Lighthizer, who's um, the United States trade representative, who essentially is very upset about um, various things that the Chinese are doing. And he's saying, you know, the rules of the World Trade Organization must change to address this behavior. Uh, and if not, then it won't become relevant. Uh, and then and then separately, there's this other thing that, you know, other, other element of the Trump administration's trade policy where they're essentially blocking the judges to the World Trade Organization's appeal system, right? So at the moment, there's a system where you can take your trade disputes to the WTO and then the judges can rule on them. And the Trump administration is blocking those. And again, that looks kind of crazy and, and outlandish and horribly destructive to many people. But if you dig a little deeper, if you if you you know if you know a little bit more about um, the history of trade policy, you'll actually realise that that is, you know, the culmination of a long term you know disagreement with the way that the World Trade Organization works, right? So so Robert Lighthizer of the USTR is 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 upset that essentially America has signed over sovereignty to this World Trade Organization, and what right do they have to rule on? you know, what we're doing. Um, do they so, have, you know, so, so some things are more startling, some things are less. <laughs> do you think they have a point? Like, when was the World Trade Organization established? And 
when did these tariffs begin to be rolled out and how early were America, the US and other countries like the UK and maybe China later on, who I don't think joined until a number of years back? When when did this all really kick off and are they really outdated and has anything changed since the initial inception of the WTO? So the WTO has only existed since 1995. So there was actually a system before the WTO, which is, I think, the one that you're referring to, which is called the the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade. And so that was established in 1947. Uh, There were 23 members, including the US, Britain, uh, China joined for a bit, and then it had its revolution and so left. The Soviet Union just never responded to the invitation to join so essentially what you had at this you know, early stage of the institution was a fairly small club. There were 23 members. Um, and, and within that club, America was clearly a very powerful member. So you had America, you had Britain. The Canadians played a, a, a fun role. They were the ones who said, uh, guys, you maybe don't want to go with this massive, massive, ambitious system. Maybe let's just get stuff done and we'll have the smaller system. So, so you start off with this smaller system. And then over time... What happens is the system expands. So it goes from 23 members to the 164 that we have today in the World Trade Organization. Um, and then also its rule book becomes longer. And then the third thing that happens is that the rule book comes with teeth, right? So in the early version of the system, if there was rule breaking, then basically you'd have some kind of negotiation. And, and if you were powerful, then you'd win that negotiation. But in the later, in the World Trade Organization, Essentially, the members signed up to this system where independent judges could rule on disputes. Um, and this is this is actually a really successful feature of the world trading system. And it and it's the kind of thing where 99.99% of the time it's really boring and it really doesn't matter because the point of that system is that it's supposed to it's supposed to sort of act as a as a pressure valve where if two countries are annoyed with each other, they think that one of them has broken the rules and it's then the dispute system is a way that they can blow off steam. So they say, you know, you have these independent judges, country A takes its complaint to the judges. If the judges say, yes, you have been wronged, then what they do is they say you have been wronged and therefore you're allowed to retaliate. You're allowed to essentially withdraw the benefits that you gave to that other person who's wronging you. And essentially, by giving those countries that outlet to let off steam, to retaliate, what you do is you prevent countries from going outside the system and taking matters into their own hands and lashing out. uh, And you prevent you prevent disputes from escalating. Right. So for the system to work, you're not supposed to notice it because it's meant to allow limited retaliation. And then it's meant to sort of, you know, diffuse the conflict. Um, And so. Over time, that well, since 1995, since when we've had that that system, it's it's worked pretty well. So, so one of your questions was, you know, have there do they have a point? Are there gaps in the rules? And I think it's fair to say that, you know, any multilateral system would come with trade offs, right? So you have a small club, 23 members. The Americans are fairly powerful. You know, the Americans and the Brits can maybe sort of, you know, bully the others into signing up to the rules. Now you've got a system of 164 countries. You need everyone to agree if you want to get anything done, right? It's this wonderfully democratic and, you know, consensus infused organization. It's lovely. But getting agreement from 164 different countries is obviously really, really difficult because any one member can hold up anything. Uh, And that means that it's incredibly difficult to write new rules. It's incredibly difficult to fill in any gaps into the system uh, because any one country can hold the whole thing up. And and that's essentially what's been happening over the last, I suppose, 15 years or so, where you have this um, philosophical disagreement between different members of the World Trade Organization, some who see... Uh, you know, some who basically want the rules to be applied to everyone and other poorer countries who think that they should get carve outs from the rules because they need the flexibility in order to develop and grow. Right. And so that that disagreement has has stopped any kind of grand negotiation from happening and meant that, you know, even if there had been sort of general agreement on where they want to fill in the rules, it would have been very difficult to get. Okay. 
what I'd wonder is, you mentioned there about a rule book, mm-hmm. and the judges can make a decision whether one is one country is being fair to another country, and they can put up a dispute there mm-hmm. and contest what the actions of another country. But what laws are are these? Are these laws based in Switzerland or are they kind of internationally recognized laws or are they something that's within that particular group that they establish these these rules that you can't follow? So how it works is that at some point, every single member of the World Trade Organization has you know, negotiated and signed up to the rules. Right. So all these judges are supposed to be doing is arbitrating over these rules that everyone has agreed. Mm. So the rules are written within the World Trade Organization and it's the World Trade Organization's, you know, judges who rule on those rules. Okay. Like recently, the Trans-Pacific Partnership that the US are also involved in, they stepped back from that too. And is that covered by the WTO or is that something different altogether and independent from? No. Yeah. So, so, so that's the, the TPP, the Trans-Pacific Partnership. And that, that's really interesting because, so one thing that's happened as it's become really, really difficult to negotiate new rules is that certain members of the World Trade Organization have sort of thrown up their hands and said, well, this isn't working. We're just going to go over here and negotiate our own smaller trade deals elsewhere. And you are allowed to do that within the World Trade Organization as long as it covers basically all trade. So you are allowed to remove pretty much all the trade barriers between little groups if you want. Um, And so the TPP was supposed to be Essentially, it represented the, you know, this strategy to write new rules that could eventually be taken into the World Trade Organization, but that essentially it was too soon to get those rules rules in. There was there wasn't <clears throat> there wasn't enough appetite within the membership for them, so they said, "Fine, we're just going to negotiate these over here." You know, America, Japan, Mexico, Canada, um, Vietnam. You know, so so they they agreed that. Uh, clearly, the Trump administration withdrew from the TPP. So, you know, if you thought that this was some part of some grand strategy to write new rules and then and then take them to the WTO and maybe that would, you know, constrain Chinese policy, you know, the, the American withdrawal clearly undermined that plan. But there's nothing to say that in a few years, the Americans couldn't rejoin if they wanted to. Oh, so they can rejoin. That's possible then, without break, without changing the rules, or would they have to accommodate this rejoining in order to have such a country come back in? Because I'm sure they might be more accommodative to the United States rather than say someone like Ireland, if Ireland decided to withdraw from the WTO and want the rules changed. Yeah. So when you're agreeing any trade deal, essentially what what you want is you want other big members, mm-hmm. and you know the TPP was essentially an American set of rules, I mean, agreed by other countries, but, you know, many in the Obama administration would say that it was cutting edge standards that were, you know, being, would have been shaped by America. So, you know, other countries want America in because, you know, so some of the poorer ones thought that it was going to get access to the American market as part of this deal. But also, you know, the idea that you've agreed all these rules and then you're going to export them to the rest of the world you're much more powerful as a bloc if you have a big country like America on board. Now, that's not to say that the other countries are just going to, you know, welcome in America with open arms. What they did when they, so, so America withdrew from the TPP and what the other countries did is they said, okay, well, we're just going to remove certain provisions that the Americans really, really wanted. So if the Americans did want to rejoin, then they're going to have to fight for those provisions to be, you know, reinserted into the pact. Uh, so, you know, and, and maybe um, they might ask the Americans to make make concessions there. I don't know. But it, I'm not sure it's going to be as straightforward as the Americans saying, great, we're, we're on board now. And everyone else saying, brilliant, you know, let's return to the original pact. I don't think it will be as straightforward as that. So, Maya, I've, I've recently heard a soundbite from Donald Trump suggesting that or saying that the EU doesn't even take American meats or beef. And they're adamant that they will put tariffs on some EU goods because of this one, ex- like, for example, because the EU won't import some of these meats. But there is a law in 
the European Union that bans certain hormone induced products that helps uh, that the Americans put into their food. And I'm sure that if I, I, I don't know if they can import some of these goods, but if their pressure is there, do you think the EU could back down or would this be a separate issue? Or when I say the EU back down, yeah, I suppose the EU at the end of the day, they can decide what to import. They don't have to go through the WTO, I don't think. But I wouldn't like to see American beef that's pumped full of hormones on the shelves in supermarkets here. Okay, so this is a kind of long-standing disagreement between the Europeans and the Americans. So there's essentially a difference in the way that the Europeans and the Americans regulate their food. So the Americans, I think, have a much more permissive regime in that they they essentially you have to sort of show that something is damaging to your health before it's it's banned, I think. And the EU, I think you have to show that it isn't damaging to health. I may have butchered that, but I'm pretty sure that's the idea. Or there's, there's essentially the onus of proof is different between the two. Um, and the Americans complain uh, in the hormone treated beef case that actually the way that the EU is rejecting its hormone its hormonal beef uh, is unscientific, right? And so, you know, they'll claim that there really isn't the evidence uh, to support the EU's blocking of the hormone treated beef. And, you know, this is this is kind of one of those really tricky areas of trade where, you know, you might think that in some cases, this is an area where essentially trade barriers are potentially not just because of protectionism, right? You might think that different countries would have different preferences over the kind of regulatory regime that they want. And those differences will show up as trade barriers. But that's not actually the primary objective of those of those policies. Right. And so this is when we get into really tricky territory about sovereignty, mm. uh, because from the EU's perspective, they, you know, many would feel that they should have the right to reject hormone treated beef if they want that's a that's a decision that's a preference that europeans hold uh it's not just because they don't like american beef and they're putting up these barriers for the hell of it um, and you know then the americans would say well no you know you've got to base this on some kind of scientific principle and and it's it's not so you know i guess what i'm saying is it's complicated yeah. uh, as a lot of trade policy is uh, there's there's obviously also a really interesting Brexit Brexit angle to this, obviously, because, you know, if the UK wants to do a trade deal with the US, then the US is going to say, brilliant, well, please do take our hormone treated beef. And the Europeans will become very suspicious of any British beef exports to the EU if they think that maybe there's, you know, the American ones are being let in through the back door. So yeah. uh, this stuff can have pretty big ramifications and is, is fairly thorny. I suppose the the Americans could think that we are adopting somewhat a protectionist policy by spinning a yarn. If it, if that's the case, as they put it, there's no scientific evidence, so they want to protect their own industry, their own agricultural industry. Uh, but there's another thing that you mentioned earlier, saying that smaller groups within the WTO could come to an agreement, like the TPP, but following Brexit. I think Ireland are under pressure not to have some kind of independent trade negotiation or more so a border, Northern Irish border, and have that kind of a special relationship that should continue between the two countries. Is there something that you would have covered in the recent past regarding the issue between Ireland and the UK with Brexit coming? Uh well, I mean, this is the Irish border issue with, with Brexit, which is a really important one. It's more of a Brexit issue than a World Trade Organization issue. Um, but fundamentally, the, the problem is that the EU has a single market. And that means that, you know, regulatory standards are aligned. So, you know, within, um, you know, across the, the, the border, the folks in the EU were fairly confident that anything that met safety, health and safety standards in Northern Ireland, you know, they would be the same standards as there were in, in you know, the Republic of Ireland. When you have Brexit, when you have Northern Ireland and, and you know, the rest of the UK 
operating its own trade policy, if there's regulatory divergence, then you need some kind of check to make sure that actually the standards in Northern Ireland are the same as the ones in, in the Republic of Ireland, right? And that that check, that requires some kind of physical border. Uh, and obviously, that's extremely difficult uh, when you interact that with the politics yeah. of the situation. Because we're seeing it play out in America in a certain way regarding Mexico. And I'm sure like when Trump first became president, the first thing he said about changing was NAFTA. And that was my first, and that was almost immediate. And I was sort of thinking, why is he going after Canada and Mexico? It doesn't make sense to try to break down NAFTA and put some tariffs up in order to protect some of the industries. I thought he would have went, well, I didn't think he'd go for anything at all. But if you were to look back in hindsight, maybe he would have gone with some of the largest uh, imports, which would be, say, China. But he went after Canada and Mexico first. Yeah, so the reason he went after NAFTA is that, I mean, so clearly Mexico, America and Canada are part of a relatively integrated economic bloc. Uh, and, you know, it's it's been essentially quite a, a favorite. It's a fun deal to bash if you're in that kind of market. You know, the kind of thing that it's easy to pin job losses on because, you know, since the, you know, uh, late 80s or early 90s has been huge change in the geographical location of jobs. So what's going on with, with NAFTA is Trump has promised to renegotiate it. He thinks that there's been a terrible deal and negotiations have been ongoing. They paused for a bit because of the Mexican election, but I think they're about to restart. And what's happening there is that essentially the Americans have identified that a lot of production that is going on under this trade deal is, is of cars. And what NAFTA does is NAFTA sets out rules that cars have to meet, have to satisfy if they want to pass without tariffs between Mexico, the United States and Canada. Right. These are called rules of origin. And so what's going on is that essentially the Americans leading this negotiation to rewrite the rules of origin because they've essentially said, hey, we can rewrite the rules of this trade deal to try and reshape production. So one of their problems is that essentially after NAFTA was agreed, what happened is that a lot of jobs emerged in Mexico that were essentially lower wage. You had a reallocation of production within America away from some regions and towards others. And what the Americans want to do is they essentially want to lift up the wages the, the the kind of the low wages uh, of those people currently operating in the car sector. And and one of the ways they're trying to do that is by saying that if you want to, your car to pass tariff free between Mexico and America, then some minimum fraction of the car must be made by people earning above a certain amount. Okay. So they're essentially trying to use the rules of this trade deal to reshape the economics and reshape production in the region. And that will satisfy, you know, Donald Trump's desire for more jobs and better paid jobs. So they think, I mean, there's a bunch of reasons why it might not work, but that is at least their objective. To me, based on textbook economics, which you can't always rely on because it's pretty much theoretical and there's assumptions and it simplifies what's going on in reality. But if Governments intervene. They should only intervene if the market fails, but they're trying to, in this case, establish a certain price, which may not be, and there may never be a, an equilibrium, but again, just based on textbook, you may not, you may go beyond an equilibrium price and make those cars more expensive. And what the Trump administration are probably trying to do is to have equal competition or to get the manufacturer to move over back into the United States and make the cars in their own country. And I, I don't know what could happen, as you mentioned. We, we just don't know what the result is going to be. But I'm sure that the aim is to have the product car, car manufacturing production return to the likes of Detroit and some of the other country, states that would have been well known for this type of manufacturing. 
Yeah, so a few things. So so I guess, first of all, you do see minimum wages, right? So it's not a completely novel idea to have some kind of minimum wage. I think the issue here is that essentially this is a protectionist element of trade deals. You Rules of origin are designed to essentially stop cars from other places that don't have any North American content taking advantage of the low tariffs. Uh, and, and so there's a, there's a strange distortion that you've got to begin with. And then the question is, how do you deal with that? I think the main tension that these American negotiators are facing is that essentially, if you're a car maker, you always have the choice to move the car from Mexico to America, just ignoring NAFTA, right? So outside of NAFTA, America charges a tariff of two and a half percent on incoming cars. So if the rules in NAFTA, the, the, you know, the standards that you will have to meet in order to get the zero tariff under NAFTA, if those standards are too high, then you might just decide to ignore the standards and and bring your car in under the two and a half percent. And so there's, you know, if you if you tighten the rules too much, then there's this risk that you essentially just end up losing a lot of the you, you lose all your bite. You're, 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 you, you grasp this thing too hard and it just, you know, um, squeezes it it, 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 it slides out from from away away from your fingers. The president is in office for five years and he could get re-elected and remain for another five. I think it's four and four, but... Oh, four and four. Fine. Okay, so <laughs> uh, I, I, in, a, in Ireland, it's seven. What mm-hmm. is, what's the prime minister in the UK? Would it be about the same? I Well, the UK parliamentary system is... There, there's the Fixed Term Parliaments Act, um, uh, but the, the, you don't elect the prime minister directly in the same way so you you just elect the governing party so the you know the prime minister could leave tomorrow if she wanted (laughs) Um. this week in the media elon musk has signed an agreement with the chinese to set up a, a tesla plant in china and this kind of flies in the face of what donald trump wants done in the u in the united states so whether elon musk is thinking ahead that Trump won't be around for long. These agreements could be reversed in five, ten years' time, and therefore, or say two uh, or up to six years' time, and therefore he's creating an opportunity when everyone is pretty much running back or abiding by the, the new laws that are coming in and maybe locating back in the United States or trying to abide by some of these rules unless they take, the, like you said, a 2.5% tariff within NAFTA. So he might see an opportunity that could really benefit a company in the future. Uh, he could. I'm not sorry. I'm not really sure I understand the question. Sorry. Oh, I, spo- I suppose it, was, it wasn't a question. I, um, I should have posed a question rather than making a statement. But um, yeah, I, I'm just wondering, would a decision like that benefit a company, even though the encouragement is to stay in the United States and manufacturing the car and export? Or I I don't know the story, but is Elon Musk doing this in the fear that he tariffs could be placed on Tesla and on any exports going to China? So I'm probably not in the weeds enough of Tesla's financial accounts to be able to sort of comment specifically on that. But, you know, clearly part of the Trump administration's strategy is to encourage investment in America. So Donald Trump thinks that things should be built should be built in America. He wants that to happen. And we do know that in the past, one of the effects of high tariffs is that companies decide to invest in the company in order to just, you know, buy, they they hop over the tariffs. And that's one thing that happened in the 1980s, when essentially there were very large trade restrictions stopping Japanese cars from being exported into America. And one thing that happened straight after that was that essentially all the Japanese car companies invested in America and now they make lots of cars there too. So, you know, we, we have seen that happen in the past. It's definitely something that could happen. I think perhaps in Donald Trump's ideal world, rather than making cars in China, you'd make them in America and then sell them to China. 
I suppose the one thing to say there is that cars are fairly heavy. And so there's not a huge amount of sense if you're making millions and millions and millions of cars in making them in America and shipping them a very long way. We tend to see, you know, over, over long periods of time, as long as you can access cheap labor uh, and all the you know raw materials that you have, we tend to see production vaguely follow you know, where the market is just because for really big objects, it's expensive to ship them. You were saying earlier on about your transition to into writing about trade with The Economist. You've said that unexpectedly, some people might, I think you said something like that. It, it might have been seen as more of a boring topic, but it's far from boring. It's, it's something that's in the media every day or every week anyway. And from that, you have your own podcast, Trade Talks, that you have with Chad Brown. And I'm wondering just how's that going for you? Because every week I have an episode released on tariffs and trade. And obviously there's plenty to go around in order to have a discussion on this. Yeah, so um, so I have a podcast with Chad Bowne. Uh He is a senior fellow at the Peterson Institute. And I think it's, well, so it's huge amounts of fun. And the reason that we started it was because I felt that there was a gap in the market, essentially for, well, trade trade <laughs> podcasting, uh, <laughs> clearly. I think there are a few copycat trade podcasts now, but we were the first, we were the first. Um, but then, you know, my, my whole idea with that is that Trade was boring. Trade was really boring. No one cared about trade for a really long time, essentially, apart from, you know, there were big protests with TTIP. But trade as its own thing couldn't really have sustained a large amount of interest from a general audience. But now, well, first of all, that's not the case. But I think the, you know, the the purpose of trade talks is to, to tell people that not only do these trade conflicts that we're seeing now, they have history, there, there are amazing stories behind them. And and now, so when you when you look at Donald Trump's Twitter feed and and you read this, you know the outlandish things that he's saying, with every single trade dispute, you have a story, right? You have some kind of domestic economic interest that's fighting with another one. You have so trade policy, the way I see it, it's basically the intersection of your foreign policy and your domestic policy, and and so you've got these you know these two two angles, um, and that just makes it. Amazing, uh, and and you know much more uh, interesting in a way than just bog standard domestic policy. And the, and the other reason, obviously, it's really interesting is because everyone blames trade for so much stuff that, frankly, it's not responsible for. <laughs> and so, uh, trade talks is also a way of saying, well, this is what trade is about, and this is what trade really isn't about. Um, you know, so just as an example. If you think if you look at the long run decline in employment in the steel industry, in part, that's because, you know, the the international steel production steel makers have just become much more competitive. But it's also because the industry itself has just become much more, much more efficient. There's been huge amounts of automation. So there's a lot of people out there who are really angry at imports for stealing their jobs, whereas actually before you needed three men to handle this incredibly hot and dangerous molten metal and now a machine does it and so maybe you only need one right but people aren't very but 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 technology is difficult to blame and so people blame trade uh, and that leads to really dangerous but interesting politics it's it's funny not funny you say that but when i was reading the economic possibilities for grandchildren by john maynard Keynes, he actually mentioned this back in 1930 that that would be the case that because of the efficiency of production, the amount of man hours he foresaw that would decrease a lot and people would end up having then a lower, shorter work week or find other means to which they could occupy their time regarding work. Um, so with some other conversations I've had on trade on the podcast, you, you did mention there that they may not be the cause of certain things, but trade would be a solution in terms of trying to minimize conflict between countries. 
And is that something you would have uh, come across in some of your episodes or research that you've done on it? Yeah, so that was definitely the vision for today's trading system. So in the 1930s, you didn't have this global trading system that we have today. What you had were these competing trade blocks. So the British had one with their imperial. They had trade preferences for their colonies. The Nazis led one. uh, The Japanese led one in Asia. And essentially, the world was very divided where you had you know, zero tariffs for your friends and higher tariffs for your enemies. And so the global trading system today was essentially crafted with this idea that those economic rivalries were very damaging and very dangerous. It would be a much better idea to link, to, to remove those trade barriers and essentially link the world's economies together. So another world war would just be too bloody. It would be too expensive. And so you would have peace. That that was the idea. I think at the time, some people saw the architects or the, or the people pushing that idea as very naive. There's an alternative story, which is that actually this wasn't about the Americans trying to paint the world into a happy, friendly rainbow land. It was actually because they were trying to open up markets for their uh, very you know, relatively powerful exporters. So, you know, the the alternative story is that actually this was just in the American self-interest and they were just doing what they do. But certainly the the nice war reducing story is a is a nice one. What I teach in one of my modules is about transfer pricing. I don't go too much into it to be honest, uh, especially when it comes to the regulations or the lack of them, and also the accounting that goes on. But just the basic understanding of what transfer pricing is, how is it that countries can engage in transfer pricing when there are like trade or tariff restrictions and um, there's corporation tax rules put in place between jurisdictions? For example, we, we know the case in the UK, and to be honest, I have to applaud David Cameron at the time for confronting the likes of Starbucks and Apple and Google about the amount of tax that corporation tax that they pay. And, you know, in Ireland as well, it's almost seen like a safe haven or a tax haven. And these companies are, we don't know, we don't want to accuse them for transfer pricing, but in relative terms, or they, they pay a very low percentage compared to other companies um, that are operating in our countries. So I think what you're talking about is slightly distinct from from the world trading system. So we're, I think, now in the realms of kind of international tax regimes. I think clearly, you know, intellectual property and that that kind of thing that is slightly covered under under international trade agreements. Uh, but I think I may be straying somewhat outside of my lane if I were to comment on yeah. uh, the Starbucks transfer pricing stuff. It's it's kind of almost underhand in terms of what, what you're looking at. You, you say trade is, and it's great, the intersection between foreign policy and domestic policy. But then you do have this happening in the background, these some com- co- uh, companies engaging in transfer pricing that is almost like a shadow of what's actually going on um, regarding the, the trade. So it is, it is uh, you, I, I agree with you, it is different to the actual yeah. trade. Yeah, and I think it's, it's, you know, so as globalization has happened, it's become easier and easier for companies to operate in many different jurisdictions. Capital, um, you know, money just moves around much more easily than it once did. And, and more quickly, you know, the click of a button. Um, and so there, there are parallels in that today, you know, it used to be the case that you'd have goods just moving around. And, and clearly the, the scope of international trade with services and you know, data and so on, that has vastly expanded. And I think the parallel is that, you know, today the, the world's trading system is struggling to keep up with that technological development and that globalization and similarly the global tax regime is struggling to keep up with this 
you know, this um, light footedness of, of various different companies and essentially the coordination that you need between different different countries if you want to have if you want to avoid a race to the bottom in terms of tax. So, Maya, can I ask you a couple of quick fire questions before we wrap up, if that's OK? Sure. I'd love to know if there is any book that you'd like to recommend for us to read based on the work that you do. As a, uh, or even magazines. <laughs> <laughs> well, of course, I'd recommend The Economist. But so I think the two best books I've read recently, there was one called Evicted, okay. uh, which was all about it was this incredible book where this guy has actually immersed himself. In, he lived he went and lived in an American trailer park um, for a very long time. And he met all the people. And there I think it's an amazing book because not only is it amazingly reported and you have all the characters, but he builds up. It's actually all about economics, right? All it's right. all about it's all about the systemic failures that they are at every single level within this trailer park. So these people in very deep poverty, and the system is broken on so many different layers. There's no one villain, and I think you know that in, in any area you look into, in any great depth, you quickly realize that there is no that that true villains are very very hard to find. And that once you understand that, I think you understand why the world has so many problems, because, you know, the world is just really complicated. And this book is the most amazing, you know, illustration of that. And then the second book that I recommend is called Janesville by Amy Goldstein. And that's about Janesville, Wisconsin, which is Paul Ryan's home state. Uh, he's a, um, the Republican politician. Mm. And it's about what happens when the car plant closes down. Uh, in the middle of the American financial crisis. And so it's what happens to this area when, the, you know, this huge source of employment ends and it's how the people in that place adjust to that. And many of them don't adjust to that. And I think what that illustrates is that often when we, you know, we, when we talk about how to help the losers from trade, you know, trade causes disruption and you've just got to compensate the losers and it'll all be fine. And I think what that book told me is that i mean it's really obvious but that's really really difficult yeah. you know and and that that's not to say that you should throw up barriers it's just to say that any kind of you know helping people when they've fallen is is tough and this this world that we have where companies can open and close it comes with benefits but there are human costs to the downside and we need to you know think about those <laughs> I, I'm guilty of that, actually, because usually I do think of the human cost, but not in this episode. And it's only when you said, mentioned the book on Jamesville, maybe I should have asked you some of the questions regarding the fallout from trade talks and the repercussions it could have on states or towns that rely on these type of companies and, and what happens to people and how do they be uh, react to it and, you know, do they react well? Because in economics, we don't really look at these type of behaviors, unfortunately. I think I think what's going to come out over the next few months and years is a million different stories of people who've been affected by the various tariffs that the Trump administration is putting in place and, and the various people affected by whatever happens with Brexit. I think these very abstract economic things are going to have tremendous real world consequences and had I been back in the Institute for Fiscal Studies, I would have been, you know, perhaps looking at the data and, and seeing how that all played out. Now I'm at The Economist. I can go and talk to them uh, and hopefully do some data work, too. It would be interesting, actually, to talk to people around Harley Davidson, because I think they're going to shut up some of their close up some of their manufacturing plants and go to the EU. Yeah, I think there's well, so it's unclear where they're actually going to go. They may not go to the EU. I think the other thing to take note when you hear these stories about these companies closing down and leaving America is that some of it will be because of the tariffs. Some of it may be an excuse for something that they would have done anyway. So I don't know what, you know, what exactly was driving Harley's decision. And so, so you know, for listeners who don't know the story, um, the EU essentially announced tariffs on Harley Davidson motorcycles in retaliation to the Trump administration's tariffs on steel and aluminium. Harley Davidson then announced that it would shut up production of its 
bikes that it would export to the EU and move them somewhere else. It didn't say where. Um, and the reason is just because it would have had to pay a huge tariff going into the EU. Um, and, and, you know, many said, I mean, including Donald Trump, he said, oh, you know, they, this was already in the works or something. So so there's a lot of, you know, question marks. I mean, you know, Harley Davidson had been, I think, over the long term, reducing its American footprint. Whether it would have done so so quickly uh, is another question. You know, in some cases, it, it, it clearly really is the fault of the tariffs that, that stuff is going on. But I think, you know, whenever you hear these stories, it's always worth thinking about whether the company might have done it anyway. So Maya, given your experience both in the IFS and The Economist, the approach to writing, I'm sure, is different. And some, usually I ask a question on any writing tips. And it's more so from, I suppose, somebody who wants to write a book or an academic piece. But in terms of an economist who's writing a, an article for a magazine like The Economist or a business newspaper, do you have any one or two writing tips that you go by that you could share with us? So as someone who reads a lot of academic articles for my job, I think sometimes there's an impression that academic writing has to be wordier or you know, more, more complicated, essentially, to, to demonstrate just how clever you are. And as a reader of that, I would argue that good writing is, is good writing wherever it is, and there is huge value to being clear and having short sentences and being understandable. You know, jargon is often something that people hide behind. Do you really need to use the 10-letter version of the word where a five-letter version is available? So, you know, clear writing, I think, has value anywhere would be my, my first point. I think one thing I did learn when, or one thing that came to me relatively late is that Essentially, there are two kinds of writers. There are the kind who essentially other people think of as natural writers who can just write out a first draft and it's perfect. And uh, full disclosure, I'm actually not one of those kinds of writers. <laughs> and then the other kind is the kind who basically needs three drafts to get what they're happy with. Uh, and I think before I came to The Economist, I would have thought that maybe because I needed three drafts, I wasn't as good a writer as the person who could just do it first time. Um, but that's, I think, you know, over time I've realized that's really not the case. <laughs> um, it doesn't, you know, you can, just because it feels like it's taken a lot of effort that you need to do a lot of rewriting to get it in the shape that you want, it, that doesn't say anything about the quality of the final product or just, you know, how good a writer you are. Um, and definitely the problem is, the risk is that if you know that you need a few, you know, rounds of editing to get something into the shape that you want it, that you label yourself a bad writer. And then that makes you worried or anxious about writing anything new. And so I suppose my, you know, my words of wisdom would be like, you're, you're still a great writer, even if it takes you a few, a few tries. <laughs> or at least that's that's what I tell myself. I absolutely agree. Uh, uh, only in so far that I can relate with what you're saying to a book that I read on writing well by William Sin uh, Sinzer. And again, something I'd re uh, highly recommend to somebody if they want to check out that p particular book and look at those tips. But to avoid reading that book, I think the few points that you mentioned there really sums up what, may, what should make a good writer and not to be, and to, to just pretty much keep it simple and write mm. in a language that's very attractive to everybody rather than trying to fit into the particular jargon that the stereotype of uh, a stereotype academic piece of work would entail. Mm -hmm. uh, one more question to me before we go, like based on our conversation here and especially the two books that you recommended, eFiction and Jamesville, I'm just wondering, would you have any plans in the near future about writing your own book, even if it's a fictional story, something like um, Moneyball? Well, oh, you, sorry, that's not even fictional. Mm -hmm. They're based on real, real right. events. Right, narrative, non-fiction, right. Yeah, or even a fictional book by like, like having something that's going on between countries that may not be the US and the rest of the EU but could be fictional countries like the way it sounds oh. a bit like you want to commission this book which which would be <laughs> would be fine I mean to be honest it's funny a few people have sort of said you should write a book um 
And I suppose they think that because I'm a writer. I At this stage, I'm not entirely convinced that it's... I think to write a book, you need to be absolutely confident that you've got something to say that is worth people's time when they read the whole book. And I'm not quite sure what that would be yet. And I think... Uh, so I think it'll be a little while before I dive into that because I just don't know what um, I think the bar to writing a book would have to be quite high, given that I'm about to move to the US and cover the US economy. And, and hopefully I'll, I'll come across the perfect story that I can write up in a, in a money ball style way. But for now, I just don't I don't know what that would be. And so I'm kind of I'm probably my book plans are on hold for now. Or it could be a Game of Thrones style leader <laughs> where they'll do the trading and there's wars and so on, <laughs> dwarves and wizards and the whole lot mixed it up. It could with, be. Are you yeah. sure you don't want to write this book? <laughs> I, don't, don't, I don't think so. Okay. I feel that I have to have the experience of knowing about trade and that exposure <laughs> that you would have. Mm-hmm. So, Maya, thank you very much for joining me on the Economic Rockstar podcast. I learned a lot. I'm very honored to have you on the show. And for anybody who wants to check out all the links, resources, and books mentioned in this episode, you can go to economicrockstar.com forward slash Sumeya Keynes and or check out your own website, Sumeya, uh, which is at sumeyakeynes.com. And there's a lot of links there regarding some of the articles and research, academic research um, that you have done. Indeed, can... everyone should check it out. Definitely. And best of luck in Washington, and I hope you uh, settle there quite quickly and keep on writing, and I'll be checking out to see what you've written about next. Thanks very much. You are an economic rock star. Well, thank you very much for having me. I'm sure our paths will cross again. Bye. Economic Rockstar is a free podcast that does not exclude anyone from listening as long as they have a device to listen, download or stream. I have many listeners from all parts of the world and I truly am pleased to know that the Economic Rockstar podcast unites all of you through the common theme of economics. I strive to commit to releasing an episode each week and aim to develop Economic Rockstar into much more than just a podcast. Patreon is a platform that gives you, the listener of the Economic Rockstar podcast, the opportunity to express your appreciation of the show by committing a financial reward for as little as $1 a month. Patreon allows me, the creator of the Economic Rockstar podcast, to be rewarded and paid by you so I can continue with the running costs of the show and to reinvest and expand the podcast into other platforms or mediums in the future. To find out more on how you can help the Economic Rockstar podcast and have your name added to the supporters list on my website, please check out my Patreon page at patreon.com forward slash economic rockstar or visit the supporters page on the Economic Rockstar website. If you enjoyed this podcast, why not leave some feedback or comments on the show notes page on economicrockstar.com where you can also sign up and be a member of the Economic Rockstar community. If you're listening to this episode on iTunes or Stitcher Radio, I would love to have some feedback and for you to leave an honest rating and review, as this will help with the rankings of the show so that more people can find it. If you're listening on the website economicrockstar.com, make sure you check out the back catalogue of all previous episodes and interviews with some amazing professors and authors at economicrockstar.com forward slash podcasts. Thanks for listening and I really appreciate your loyal support. I know how much you love audio, so why not get a free audiobook with Economic Rockstar today? I've teamed up with audiobooks.com to bring you this amazing offer. Visit audiobooks.com forward slash rockstar to download your free audiobook now.